Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We shall be addressing ourselves to a consideration of the relationship between economic activities and the institutional backdrop to these activities that exist in any society. Let us first ask what the word institution refers to. The simplest way of looking at institutions is that they are instituted, but that is getting away from having to face the problem by simply rephrasing the whole thing. What do we mean anyway when something is instituted, something that has been established? There seems to be a general consensus among everybody who talks about institutions that they constitute things that exist in a society at any point of time. They are structures, visible and invisible. They are norms, they are codes of conduct, they are physical things, non-physical things, but all sorts of things that exist in a society almost as if they constitute the boundaries or the pathways through which economic conduct happens. The thing about it is that at any point of time for any set of economic activities to exist, there will always be a set of institutions constituting their backdrop. In order to understand this better, it might be better to break up the idea of institutions into the components. There are social institutions, there are political institutions, there are economic institutions, there are monetary institutions, there are ideological institutions, there are institutions serving all kinds of purposes. What is important is that the institutions constitute what we usually call the establishment. Everything in the society constitutes itself within the backdrop of the establishments that exist in the society. Economic activities for example, happen because there are institutions and within institutions. I want to purchase something in the market, so I go to the market. In order, in order to go to the market, I take a bus and the bus is organized by an institution by the government which operates transportation. And once I am in the market, there is an institutional structure within which the shops and stalls of sellers in the market are organized. There is an institutional structure which invisibly regulates the behavior of myself and the sellers vis-a-vis -vis each other. There is an institutional norm which is adopted by the buyers and sellers in the market invisibly as it were, non tangibly as it were in regard to the way they negotiate, in regard to the way they arrive at a conclusion to negotiations and in regard to the way they conclude the transaction. Having concluded my transaction from the market, I return back to where I live. And when I come back, I come back to a home. A home is different from a house. A house is a structure, but a home is where my people live. In other words, I come back to my family. My family is an institution too. And my family members are connected to other families through a relationship of kinship which is another institution. Then they are related to others who speak the same language, which is the linguistic group and so on and so forth. Members of families might belong to different political parties with different ideologies. 
another set of institutions. Then my family members might go to a temple periodically. Those are religious institutions. They might subscribe to particular forms of belief, particular forms of worship, which again are ideological institutions. So, as it were, we are surrounded, we are surrounded by institutions in whatever we do. They constitute virtually the spaces within which we constitute our own movement in society, in economy, in our activities. More important, while institutions pre exist for any set of actors to perform their economic activity, it is also a fact that economic activity itself has a strong bearing on the nature and structure of instrument institutions over a period of time. Institutions can change due to the conduct of economic activity. For example, a particular food item, food item or food article becomes very popular. Maybe it is because it is a cheap, easy food available to people. They start consuming it. But having started consuming this food, they find that it becomes a habit. And having become a habit, it becomes an institution of culture. A few years down the line then, I might be thinking of consuming this particular thing, not because it is cheap or costly or because of any other economic reason, but simply because it is a practice, it has become my culture. Here is a situation then, where economic activity engenders institutions. So, we have a symbiotic relationship between economic activities and institutions. Institutions constitute the backdrop to economic activity and at the same time economic activity through time tends to alter, modify and get to adapt institutions that exist around these activities. We can classify institutions into the kind of preoccupations with which these institutions are concerned. We can think of economic institutions, we can think of political institutions, we can think of cultural institutions and we can think of ideological institutions. We have seen these things briefly. Economic institutions are any number which you can think around you. The banks are economic institutions, the financial organizations which help you invest your money and transact in your uh, investing investment activities are financial institutions. You have employment, which is an economic institution. You have jobs, which are economic institutions. Anything to do with money, anything to do with your making a living, anything to do with your spending, your what you earn as a living, they are all economic institutions. We do not need to go into the detail. But all these economic institutions need institutions, which guarantee that economic activities can go on uninterrupted without being threatened. For example, all contracts which are signed as a part of economic transaction must have a sanctity given to them by law. They should be legitimate. Now, the legitimacy to economic conduct is given by laws and the agencies which enforce these laws on behalf of the government. So, these are political institutions. Principal are institutions of property. The constitution of a country is a major institution and amongst the things which are enshrined in the constitution is the right to property. In most democracies, the right to property is a very central right that is guaranteed to its citizens. Now, property is a major institution under which all kinds of, under the rubric of which all kinds of other rights are encompassed. These are political institutions. Cultural institutions are institutions that are significant in their influence on tastes, habits, consumption patterns, behavior patterns, thought patterns and so forth. In the early days, when Kellogg breakfast foods, 
wanted to set up its business in Japan, it was found that the Japanese did not have a habit at all of eating cereals for breakfast. But the management of Kellogg said, it is fine, we will be there in the market. We will be there in the market till such time as breakfast cereals become a habit with the Japanese and it took 7 years. Kellogg was in the Japanese market, tirelessly present, just waiting, waiting, waiting with their stock of breakfast foods on all the shop stores and inventories till such time as the Japanese slowly switched to breakfast foods and Kellogg's became a big selling brand. This is one thing. Kellogg understood the culture of the Japanese, awaited a transformation in culture till such time as breakfast food became a culture of the Japanese and the market for Kellogg's products became established. This is a cultural institution. Another cultural institution is the institution very common in India of caste. Caste is a group of people who are said to be endogamous, that is who marry among themselves and observe rules which are shared by other caste members. But the very powerful institution, the powerful role of this institution of caste through history has been to conserve and concentrate the holding of property within the group. For example, the idea of cross cousin marriages within the caste in South India historically has engendered the holding of the property within the same family groups no matter how marriages took place. So, once again cultural institutions have a strong bearing on the economy. Ideological institutions are many, let us consider some which are absolutely unique to India, religion. The big temples which are visited by hundreds of thousands of people each day, like the one in Tirupati for instance, the Balaji temple are, relig are religious institutions which cater to the ideological needs of the people, which cater to the needs of the people to believe in specific ideas about the universe, about the nature of the world, about the nature of life, nature of existence and so forth. And these temples occupy a central role in those sets of beliefs and in that ideological universe. Why do hundreds of thousands of people go to Balaji each day? They go there because Balaji has a central role in the ideological universe of the people who go there. Now, Balaji therefore, and the, Bala and the temples connected with Balaji, not only in Tirupati, but elsewhere in India and abroad are all institutions which cater, cater to the ideological requirements of people. But it is not as if they exist in isolation. There are lakhs and lakhs of rupees which circulate, which are exchanged, which are utilized in and around the Balaji temple day after day after day after day. In short, there is a strong economy which surrounds all the temples. Vast number of goods and service services are bought and sold and vast quantities of money is exchanged in transacting these goods and services. Through history, temples have been major sources of generation of economic activity. So, Ideological institutions again have a strong bearing on economic activity. Now, the reason why standard economic theory has not bothered much about institutions, the reason why we do not talk of the role of institutions for instance in the theory of the firm, why we do not talk of the role of institutions for instance in consumer behavior or why we do not talk of institutions for instance while talking about money illusion or any such economic concept. The reason we, why we do not talk about institutions is that economic theory has in a measure shielded itself by making certain postulates about the state of the world within which the theory functions. For instance, the postulate of hedonism. Economic theory rests on the assumption that people are all pleasure seekers and pain avoiders. It is an old utilitarian 
postulate which goes back to early 19th century and it starts with the belief that everybody is fundamentally trying to avoid pain and seek pleasure. Now, this definition of human beings considerably restricts the number of things which you can assume the human being to be concerned with. Can we ask are there not a large number of things which are not simply pleasure seeking activities which the human being is associated with? The answer would be yes of course, but you can always find out that every activity even if it is not apparently a pleasure seeking activity actually ends up to be a pleasure seeking activity. The other phase, the other phase of this assumption, other phase of this postulate is the assumption that people are maximizing utility. Seeking pleasure is another way of saying and more technically in economics we say people are maximizing utility. So, when I am saying I am helping somebody, I am being altruistic, the hedonist can always turn around and say of course, I am helping people because it maximizes my utility, I get a kick out of helping people. So, the fundamental assumption is whatever you do, even if you are not hedonistic, you are being hedonistic, that is central in economics. That is one way the subject shields itself from non-essentials, at least non-essentials from a theoretical point of view. The second assumption which is central to this, which is a corollary of this hedonistic argument is that people are rational. In other words, there is not much of an unconscious or a subconscious aspect of the mind which enters people's activity. They are not only hedonistic, but they calculate the odds each time they undertake a hedonistic activity. In other words, they look at the constraints within which the activity is possible and they try to maximize the gain of pleasure or utility or whatever it is that they are seeking to maximize within the constraints. Now, this working within constraints and maximizing the results is a standard definition of what is economic rationality. The third which is central postulate of economics is that most economic situations are predictable. Most economic situations are predictable in the sense that you can anticipate that they are going to happen. There is fairly considerable repetitiveness about economic situations and therefore, it is possible to anticipate economic situations with a fair amount of ease. Now, this predictability of economic situations is one which enables the economist to pronounce the laws in, in economics. All the laws in economics assume that human, be, human behavior is predictable. The law of diminishing utility for instance assumes very centrally or even postulates that there is a predictability about human behavior which enables you to identify enough evidence for this law. So, the predictability of human conduct is a very central postulate within economics, which is not very visible, but it is there. And finally, almost all of economic theory starts with a very perfect world, where people know everything. In fact, the finest economic ideal is the ideal of a Walrusian market, in which people come in the thousands to a country market with perfect knowledge. Each person knows exactly everything about the market and everything about the goods and the terms and conditions under which transactions are being held, so that there is no uncertainty. And we know that perfect knowledge, which is the same as perfect certainty, is the other phase of the Walrusian economy. Now, it is because of these central postulates that we find that economic theory shields itself as it were among a wall of postulates. However, this does not mean that institutions can be overlooked. Our purpose here is to show 
that there are all kinds of institutions, institutions which are constantly not only circumscribing economic activity, but are also constantly providing directors and markers for economic conduct. As a result of this, we cannot simply assume that profit is maximized by firms. What is important is to know the manner in which they behave in order to maximize profits. And the manner in which they behave is always circumscribed by institutions. There are political and economic institutions, there are cultural institutions, which every firm faces all the time in the business of maximizing profit. So, the simple business of equating marginal cost with marginal revenue to maximize profits is really not all. There is a whole lot of behavior, there is a whole lot of economic conduct within institutions that lies behind this. There are basically three approaches which we find that study institutions. One approach which studies institutions is a Marxian approach. The other approach which studies institutions is the transaction cost approach used usually by what are these days called institutional economists. The third approach is a social or cultural or economic anthropological argument, which talks of the interrelatedness between social institutions and economic conduct. Let us look at these in some detail. Marxian approach, in a sense, can be said to be deterministic. When we say determinism, we mean that there is a logic behind economic processes, which pushes the economy in particular directions, which are predictable. In Marx, the determinism, determinism comes from a particular type of history with which he is preoccupied. And it also comes from a certain type of materialism, which is unique to Marx. We all know that Marx uses the method, which we know as historical materialism. It is a historical approach. It assumes that human conduct evolves through history or transforms itself through history. And the compulsions underlying this transformation of human activity are material compulsions. And therefore, it is historical materialism. In the case of Marx, historical materialism involved a combination of two different types of approaches that existed in the 19th century. One was materialism, which had become significant in the first half of 19th century as a major preoccupation among European thinkers. The other was the idea of dialectics, which was part of Hegelianism as a philosophy at the same time as Marx. Let us look at these two things in a little bit of detail, so that we may be able to understand Marx and his institutionalism in some depth. Materialists believe that everything can be tracked down to the material origins of the thing. In other words, materialists do not accept any other universe of discourse than the material universe of discourse. There is no metaphysics within materialism. There is no spiritualism within materialism. There is no concern with religion and materialism. If, it, if there is, then the concern of materialists with religion is a materialistic concern of religion. In short, if materialists are concerned with religion, 
is they are concerned not with the metaphysical speculative aspect of religion, but they are concerned with how people spend money, how people create employment, how people conduct economic activities in the name of religion. In short, materialism is a form of belief which assumes that everything has material causes and everything has a material function to perform in this world. So, Marxian materialism goes back to this tradition of materialism, whereby nothing non-material is assumed to exist as a basic cause and effect of consequence of human action. The other phase of Marx as we saw was dialectics. Dialectics as we know is Hegelian in origin, it is different from dialectics in the Greek sense. Dialectics at the time of Aristotle for instance meant debate. A dialectician among the Greeks was a man who indulged in debates on various matters. Whereas, a dialectician post Hegel was a person who believed in the philosophy of the unity of the opposites. In Hegelian philosophy, the universe is con constituted of a large number of unities of opposites. Each thing, each situation, each historical epoch in Hegelian thinking was assumed to consist of seeds of its own destruction. In short, if in an epoch there were forces which constitute the dominant leadership of that epoch, there were forces which tended to resent that epoch that tended to work against the interest of the epoch. But together the two forces, those which tended to perpetuate the epoch and those which tended to oppose it are a unity together they constitute the epoch and which is why Hegelian argument talks of unity of the opposites. Now, forces which constitute the defense of the epoch are usually referred to as a thesis. Forces which constitute the opposition to the epoch are usually those factors which are referred to as antithesis and together they constitute a thesis consisting of an antithesis and a thesis. I am sorry, they constitute a synthesis together constituting a thesis and an antithesis. But this is not a static situation, because when there is contradiction, there is dynamics. When there is contradiction, there is tension. So, the contradiction and tension among these opposed forces within the society over a period of time develops into a conflict and eventually one of the forces usually the antithesis overthrows the thesis and results in a new epoch, a new synthesis. So, human history is conceived of by Hegelians as a series of leapfrogging movements from synthesis to synthesis to synthesis to synthesis and in each epoch there is a unity of opposites there is a contradiction between thesis and antithesis and this is history. Now, this Hegelian version of history is taken in by Marx and combined with materialism. Marx for instance combines the idea that material forces constitute everything in human life with the idea that there is a unity of opposites. The genius of Marx lay in framing dialectics within material confines. And in order to do this, Marx develops his own concepts. The central concept in Marx then is the concept of mode of production. A mode of production is the way the production process and the material resources involved in the production process the material relationships involved in the production process are organized at any point in time during any epoch.
the mode of production is the way a whole society is organized around its productive resources. Central to this mode of production is the economic part of it, where production happens, where there are conditions of technology, conditions of resources, conditions of nature within which production happens, which are production conditions. And there are, there are relationships among people who are involved in the production process, which are production relations. So, there is an economic base to every mode of production, which is nothing but a combination of production conditions and production relations. This economic base is the one which is responsible for the organization of the resources of the economy into output, into earnings, into income, into spending in expenditure and growth. Around this economic base are organized institutions of property, institutions of marriage and family, which in many Marxian writings is said to be institution of property it itself, because family is said to be a property, marriage is said to be a property relationship among many Marxist writings. So, the fact of the matter is social institutions, political institutions and cultural institutions are woven in and around the economic base. They are not independent of the economic base in Marxian argument. They are very much part and parcel of the way the economy is organized. For example, if you have a capitalist system, then you have a dominant production relation, which is the relationship of workers with the employers of workers. This is a dominant production relationship. And this happens within the conditions of production possible, which is the technologies, which is also the resource constraints facing the capitalist producers. But more importantly, surrounding this production relationships are a whole lot of social and political relationships and economic relationships, which are not just in production, which lie, seem to lie outside the production. For example, institutions of property are not directly concerned with production, but institutions of property are very much at the backdrop of, of all production relations. A capitalist is a capitalist because the institutions of property legitimize his position in the society. A worker is a worker precisely because his, his sale, his marketing of his working power, his labor power as a commodity in the system is legitimized by the laws of capitalism. In short, all the political institutions surrounding production relations of capitalism, all the social relationships surrounding the production relations of capitalism constitute virtually the superstructure of society, which is constructed on the economic base. In short, this is the reason why Marxism is considered a deterministic school of thought, for the simple reason that everything is pushed in one direction by the centrality of production relations in Marx. Be that as it may, it is important to note at this point that the role of institutions in Marxism becomes clearly explained in terms of the role of production relations which lead to these institutions. For example, Many social institutions in India are analyzed and studied by Marxists in very typically Marxian class contradiction terms. The relationship between the landowner and worker in rural areas is often interpreted by sociologists and anthropologists in terms of the caste relationship. The dominant members of the group of workers are said to constitute a particular caste in the village. The dominant members of the employers are said to constitute another caste in the village. So, while the social anthropologists would look at the village as a caste society, 
the Marxist would look upon the society village as a class society. He would look upon the formation of castes as a subtle and concealed form of formation of classes in the village. So much so that the analysis of relationships among castes would in Marxist terms be the same as analysis of relationship among classes. In short, caste relationships are a part and parcel of production relations within the Marxian framework of analysis. This is crucial because Marxists tend to believe, I repeat, that material forces are central and dominant and they are deterministic. So, institutional explanations or explanations of institution by Marx and Marxists are centrally through production processes and production relations. For a long time, there was a dispute about whether superstructure was really a superstructure, whether there was autonomy at all to social institutions and so forth. Now, one of the persons who questioned this was a great sociologist Max Weber. Max Weber said that power that people exercised toward others was a domain of its own. It had nothing to do with the fact that power was related to money or wealth or assets or resources. Weber argued that power was exercised because it mattered on its own. Power was not exercised in order to capture resources. So, the Marxian argument that everything was tied to the ownership of means of production was not accepted by Weber. Weber said power was a discourse of its own in society and a lot of Weberian writings enforce this position. But to the Marxist, Weberian arguments were not acceptable. To the Marxists, the centrality of material forces even in power and domination was unquestionable. So, the Marxian approach to institutions is a dialectical approach, it is a materialist approach. The Marxists would argue that the whole of democracy in a capitalist sense was nothing but the organization of a political system to suit the interest of the property class which constitute the capitalists. For example, all of modern democracies according to Marxists guarantee the ownership of property, the right to property. According to Marxists, this is because these societies are also capitalist societies. There is no right to property to the workers who have sold everything that they have. In other words, the society is clearly demarcated into those who own property and most of others who do not own property. In short, the political organization of society and its laws, not just the laws of property, but the laws surrounding the upholding of property, the laws surrounding the enforcer, enforcement of property rights, the laws surrounding the institutions of law making, the laws surrounding the institutions of law enforcement. In short, virtually every political institutions within these societies according to Marxists centers around the fact that it is a capitalist production relation, which is the reason many socialist societies, socialist countries in the 1950s and 60s declared themselves as true democracies. Many socialist countries, for instance, would say democratic republic of X, Y or Z. They would say this because in the Marxian argument, a true democracy is one where property rights did not come in the way of the rights of people with each other. So, they believed that in a society which is socialist, where property rights were not legal, where property rights were not permitted, where property rights were not on. It is these societies which are true democracies. In other words, where the dictatorship of the proletariat, the rule of the communist party was guaranteeing equality of everybody within the legal system irrespective of whether they own property or not. This is a true democracy 
according to many socialist societies. So, in Marxian system, the law making and the legal institutions are always considered as secondary because they are caused, influenced and directed by the way production is organized in these societies. So, all arguments of liberalism is considered by Marxists as arguments upholding capitalism, individual rights, individualism, all these things are acceptable only because the individual is considered an isolated society, isolated member of the society and has nothing to do organically with other mem members of the society. And therefore, according to Marxists, a society which guarantees individualism is also a society which guarantees property, which also guarantees production relationships of the capitalist type. So, there is no difference in the eyes of a Marxist between so called liberal institutions and capitalist institutions. It is a matter of degrees, it is a matter of grades. Somewhere in his famous writing called German ideology, Marx says, I am paraphrasing, during the development of capitalism there emerges a group of capitalists who pretend that they are not capitalists, who pretend that they are very different and who pretend in fact, they have nothing to do with capitalism. But when the capitalist society itself is endangered, all such artificial rifts among capitalists quickly vanish. In short, Marx is probably referring at this point in time to the liberals, who tend to believe that they believe in rights of the individual as superior to any other rights including property rights. Marx was probably arguing that the rights to individual are significant as long as the individuals have property. If the individuals do not have property, then there is probably a question of whether the rights of individuals matter at all. So, all political institutions, all ideological institutions are part of superstructure and therefore, caused and engendered by production relations within the society. What about religion? What about religious institutions? As Marx studied religious institutions, he felt that very often religious institutions were used as a cover to conceal the fact that there is exploitation going on within the society. Very often Marxists argued that religious arguments were used to pacify people so that they may not perceive that they were being exploited by others in the society. It is from these beliefs that the famous statement attributed to Marx comes, religion is the opiate of the masses. <coughs> to sum up the Marxian view, to sum up the Marxian view, it could be argued that all institutions constitute the superstructure of the mode of production. Then the mode of production itself consists of two components, the superstructure and the economic base. And the economic base consisting of production conditions and production relations plays the dominant role within the mode of production. All institutions within the superstructure are institutions which arise or which exist in order to support, perpetuate a particular mode of production. So that you have a whole lot of political institutions which are capitalist within the capitalist society. You have a whole lot of political institutions which are feudal within the feudal society. Monarchy for instance is a part of feudalism. You have a whole lot of social relationships, which are 
part of particular modes of production which conform to particular production relations. Indian caste system and the rural hierarchies that a result out of caste are considered by Marxists as a part of feudal or semi feudal organization of rural India as a result of which society is organized into exploitative cost castes and exploited castes. In the 1960s, there was a considerable debate among Marxists in India about the categorization of Indian rural society. While some members of the Marxist thinkers attributed to feudalism a lot of things that was found in rural India including caste. Others like great economist Amit Bahaduri attributed to a phenomenon called semi feudalism all institutions of caste and caste relationships. In short, Marxian association with rural India, Marxian association with rural Indian society has strongly again lain within the boundaries and limits of materialism, boundaries and limits of their preoccupation with modes of production within which are central the production relations. While this is the Marxist view of institutions, there are other views of institutions which lie in diametric contrast to the Marxist view, two of which we shall examine sh a short while later. One is the transaction cost approach, which is the approach of modern institutional economists like Douglas North. And then there are the economic and social anthropological approaches, which in which we find prominent the approaches by Max Weber the approaches by Emil Durkheim and in India in the writings of the great sociologist M. N. Srinivas. We shall consider these options after the break.